Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this session. Um, does the internet speak your language? Uh, welcome to all those who chose to be here and to those who may have wandered in by mistake, please stay. Uh, but as we begin, uh, I'd like you all to think about the prompt, what is the word welcome in your languages of choice? So once again, what is the word welcome in your languages of choice? And then I'd like you to, if you'd like to, this session is recorded. So if you would want to, uh, please uh, open up your cameras, open up um, your mic, and let's say welcome in all the different languages of our choice. One, two, three, go everyone. Welcome, swagatam, everyone. It's lovely to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Anasuya Sengupta, and I'm uh, the co founder and co director of Whose Knowledge, a feminist collective to center the knowledges of marginalized communities, or as we like to remind people, the minoritized majority of the world online. Um, and I'm now going to share my screen so that we start off. Uh, let's see if tech is our friend right now. Excellent. Can everyone see this clearly? Okay, excellent, thank you. Thank you for saying that by voice. Um, so this is the question we came to you with, does the internet speak your language? And the seven of us who are here welcome you. Salamat datang, swagatam, bienvenides, elan bekam, welcomen, hoyo hoyo, and shagoto. Those are just some of what we have discovered are possibly the over 20 to 25 languages the seven of us speak amongst us. Um, so you can imagine why we came together to create uh, what we call the State of the Internet's Languages Report. But before that, um, just some love, respect, solidarity practices for our session today. Uh, be your fully present multiple selves as you bring love into the room, bring the love of languages, on the internet and otherwise into the room and the chat box. Please respect yourselves, each other and time. Let's affirm multiple lived experiences, including of languages and the diversities of bodies and gender expressions in this room. Let's be in solidarity with each other, but also aware of privilege as we create together. So let's speak slowly and chat clearly as far as possible so we can understand each other and express solidarity in both language and in action. Um, for all those who feel like chatting and sharing your thoughts on social media as we do this session, here are all our various handles and our hashtags, um, Internet's languages, and of course, as you all know, MOSFEST and MOSFEST 2022. So to answer the question, does the internet speak your language? We essentially, created over the last two and a half years, the State of the Internet's Languages Report. We launched just two weeks ago. So for all those who haven't enjoyed the, the knowledge of this fantastic launch, uh, here we are launching again in the Mozilla community, which is very much a community of joy and um, hope and possibility. Uh, for all of us and definitely of solidarity. So internetslanguages.org is the website. Um, what we're going to do is start you off with a little video that gives you a taste, a teaser of what you will find on the website. internet. <laughs> Relatório do estado dos idiomas da internet. Informe sobre o estado das línguas na internet. The state of the internet's languages. Aslana, 
le dira sa letra en la tabla. In particular, we have been considering how indigenous peoples from across and beyond Turtle Island, formerly called Canada, the United States. Informe sobre el estado de las lenguas en Internet. The state of the Internet's languages. So videos come up despite <laughs> um, the uh, stopping them. So here we go. Um, That was just a taste, and we hope you will explore the website, which is digital first, much more. But who are we? We are Whose Knowledge, we are the Oxford Internet Institute, and we are the Center for Internet and Society, Bangalore, India. And we are over a hundred people from across the world who worked in many different ways, contributed by voice, by text, by visual, uh, by so many different forms of embodied experience, by reviewing, by translating this report. Why did we choose language um, to do this research action project? As we said before, all of us who are involved um, and have been involved in doing this work are bilingual or multilingual. And as we started thinking about the internet that we wanted, and the internet of joy and liberation for us, we thought so much in terms of language and how limited our experience of the internet is when we think about it through our languages of choice, our languages of birth. So for all of us who are techies, I think this is a really important moment to pause and to say language is not just about tech, Language is about the socio-political and economic infrastructures of the ways we think, believe, and know. These are epistemic infrastructures. They are about knowing and being. Language is a proxy for knowledge. Anyone who is bilingual or multilingual knows that when you think in one language, you feel and do and know in that language differently than another. I speak and know in Bangla differently than I speak and know in English. So to be multilingual is to honor and affirm the full richness and textures of our many selves and our different worlds better. So then an internet that is not multilingual and not multimodal is inherently an unjust internet for most of us in the world. And I just want to bring in a little bit of poetry because poetry always explains the complex so much more beautifully than any other words can. And I think we understand the depth of what language means to us in poetry and music um, so much more easily. So this is a little couplet from a poem called Urdu by Latif Siddiqui. Urdu is one of the languages that I love. Um, and the couplet goes, ye payame dositi ye ashati ka asama fikra of fun ka ye samandar ye zubanu ka jahan this is the language of friendship the reconciliation of skies an ocean of art and knowledge this world of language so in this report what did we ask and aim for We know that we have over 7,000 spoken and signed languages in the world. How many can we fully experience online? What would a truly multilingual and multimodal internet look, feel, and sound like? So we try to map the current status of languages on the internet, raise awareness of the challenges and the opportunities in making the internet more multilingual, and together to advance an agenda for action. What we did and are continuing to do is we bring together stories and numbers. The stories are deep embodied experiences from our contributors from 12 countries, every populated continent in 13 languages, uh, both in the stories as well as through translations. And then we did a bunch of number crunching 
of publicly available data across different platforms and websites, 11 websites, 12 Android apps, 16 iOS apps, Google Maps and Wikipedia as two examples in which we went a little further and in more in depth, and we'll come back to all of this. And then there's a summary which weaves together the stories and numbers and is, we hope, a community re uh, resource um, just as it has been community reviewed. And I hope we um, are able to share it as a form of solidarity in action. This is also always a work in progress. We continue to invite different folks who want to translate this. Uh, we continue to invite resources that you think will improve this, and especially from the Mozilla community to look at um, the actions we suggest and um, come back to us in case we miss uh, missed anything or uh, to continue imagining and dreaming with us. So what did we learn? Some key takeaways. The internet is nowhere near as multilingual as we imagine or need it to be. Only about 500 of the 7,000 plus signed and spoken languages um, are represented in any major form of information or knowledge. So most people have to use their nearest European colonial language, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, or regionally dominant language, Mandarin, Chinese, or Arabic to access the internet. So for most of us in the world, we are not coming onto the internet, accessing content, and even less contributing content in the languages of our birth, in the languages of our choice. There are historical and ongoing structures of power and privilege that are therefore intrinsic to the way that languages are accessible or not online. So in our uh, conversation together today, we're going to give you a deeper glimpse of some of what we did uh, with the State of the Internet's Languages report. Uh, unsurprisingly, the acronym becomes STILL, what? Still not multilingual enough, still? Um, so the what, how, and what next? And then together, I hope we will um, uh, be in conversation around our wish list for a multilingual, multimodal internet. We'd like you straight away to start thinking about the one wish you have for a multilingual, multimodal internet. And we'd like you to think about it in your language of choice, uh, whether it's English or any other language, please think about your wish in a language of your choice. So I'm going to start by um, introducing you to our extraordinary uh, com compañeras and compañeros and compañeras, all our friends who have come together to do this work with us. And I'm going to start with Amna. Amna is the co-founder and founder of different um, organizations based in Tunisia around digital citizenship and culture. She has been Wikimedian of the year because she is one of the global community leaders of the Wikimedia movement, but also, of course, a great inspiration um, to Tunisian, Arab and African communities in the open knowledge and open culture worlds. So Amna, given all of your many different languages and experiences online, what do you see as the key challenges that you experience and what would your one wish be for a multilingual internet? Over to you. Thank you so much, um, Anna Soya. Thank you so much to whose knowledge and uh, the most fast for this opportunity to speak about what's happening actually with our languages in the internet. We would assume, as you mentioned earlier, that we're presented online, we're presented um, in the internet and the um, technology um, and that if we go there, you, we would find what we need. But actually, um, being a Wikimedian opened up uh, my eyes a lot. Um, it opened my eyes on the lack of knowledge um, and it opened my eyes to the lack of contribution because of many, many things that we uh, discussed and we uh, put in the report. Um, but also it um, 
it drove me to um, to speak to many people to understand um, what languages we uh, we want, what languages we use. Um, and so here for the question, why do we have to write in another language? Actually for multiple reasons, because as I said, there is a lack of knowledge. Um, we don't know how to um, access the information or resource in our own language. If that language exists, um, we don't, um, or the search engines, they do not understand us. They do not understand our language. Um, coming from um, an African and Arab background, I would tell that our history is very oral. And so we're missing a lot. It's not written. It's, um, it's cascaded and it's um, transmitted from generation to the other orally. And so we're missing a lot. So we do not write. The um, author cannot see yes if we do not write. Um, this is why we go to other languages. As you mentioned earlier, Anasuya, we go to the nearest language, um, big language such as the colonial languages, um, French in uh, the Tunisian um, uh, situation, for example, or English um, to those um, who speak it in North Africa, um, for example, in Egypt, we go to um, standard Arabic, um, which is not the local language. So here, comes the definition of what's the language. Is it the language that has an international code, a language that is um, globally known as a language, or is it the language that we speak when we are born? Um, so for example, I would say I speak, my first mother tongue is Tunsi, uh, the, the dialect of Tunisia, or the Derja. Um, it's the same for other people in other countries across um, Africa, for example. There are multiple languages. Um, we know that we, uh, in North Africa, for example, we speak Arabic um, by default. Uh, we study standard Arabic, but also we speak um, our local languages. And those local languages, they are not known online until very recently we started with, for example, blogging uh, with our own languages to own that space. Um, but still that would lead us to um, a lot of challenges. Um, and so one of the examples that I faced um, or I discussed with a person uh, during this research was that why they would go to their own language or their dialect to write and they said they feel and think in that language, so they want to write in it. But what we are uh, observing as challenges is, for example, the uh, social media platforms, they don't know that language. And so sometimes community standards or term of services um, end up taking down that content. And that creates some frustration. Um, just to wrap up um, and to finish with my wish um, here, uh, I would say it in English then in um, standard Arabic as a language of my choice right now. Um, I wish that the automatic translation, which are being great tool um, online and so social media, for example, I wish they become more um, efficient um, when they translate from Arabic to other languages because now the translation makes zero sense. And it's rather funny then, um, efficient and accurate. Um, I hope to be able to write more information on the social media platforms and more information on the social media And thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Amna, for that. Um, so much richness in what you said. And I'm sitting with one of the things you said, which I think will resonate with Pasca, whom I'm going to um, turn to next, but you said, if we don't um, speak the language that the internet speaks, we are not seen. So to paraphrase you a little bit, but if we don't speak a dominant or a colonial language, uh, we are not seen. 
And so I'm going to turn to Pasca now, who is Digital Intelligence Manager at the Center for Digital, Digital Society, Indonesia. Their research interests include social media use by minority groups, digital activism, queer internet, and information access in the global south. And Pasca, for you in particular, one of the most moving things as we uh, were looking at your contribution and learning from it is the depth of um, invisibility and lack of content, of queer content, of co content for non-binary folks in Bahasa Indonesia, which is, as we know, one of the most spoken languages across the world. Um, you know, Indonesia and Indonesians are on the web, in, are highly connected, and yet there's such a, a depth of invisibility and a lack of content of your choice. Can you tell us about your challenges in accessing and contributing content and your one wish for a multilingual internet? Terima kasih, Hannah Suya. Um, terima kasih, Husno Rich, um, for the opportunity given to me to share my experience and to explain a little bit about the condition of Indonesia when it comes to um, queer-related content. So I will be speaking mostly based on my personal experience and also based on my personal observation as a part of the minority group in Indonesia. So um, growing up, it, I was really struggling with my identity. Um, and I was growing up in a very conservative environment in a small town in Indonesia. And I didn't really have access to the outside world. So the internet is basically the only gateway for me to learn about you know, who I am, about my community, about my identity. And back then, my I, I have very I had very limited um, English skill. I didn't really understand a lot of things in English, so I had to resort to using my native language, Indonesian, to find content related to um, LGBTQIA plus uh, queer content that can help me understand my identity, can help me understand who I am as a person. Um, but unfortunately, uh, when it comes to queer content in Indonesia, it was very difficult to find affirming content, to find content that could educate, that could help people from the um, gender and sexual minorities. So um, when I contributed this essay to um, the state of um, the internet languages report, I was wondering if the same condition, if the same situation that I experienced before 10 years ago when I was a teenager still happened right now. So I tried, I did a little bit of research. I did some interviews with people from my community and it turns out the situation didn't, doesn't really change. It's still the same. After 10 years, it's still very difficult to find content um, tailored for the um, LGBTQIA plus community. It's still very difficult to just, you know, Google something or find something on the search engine of your choice and find some positive content related to the community. If you search um, homosexualitas, for example, or um, LGBT and other keywords related to um, the queer community, the results that you find would be those articles, those uh, search results that actually condemn the community. So um, I'm thinking how important it is to create more affirmative content for the community to help the younger generation, especially to help those who are less privileged because I have to admit that I'm very privileged right now. I, I'm able to understand English. I'm able to search content in English. I'm able to read content in English. And that's a huge privilege. When it comes to other people in Indonesia, a lot of them are not able to understand English easily. So if they want to find queer content on the internet, sometimes they don't really understand what the content is about. And if they want to find content in Pasa, Indonesia, for example, it will be very difficult for them to find some positive educational affirming content that could um, reinforce this, um, that could justify their identity, that could embrace them as a queer individual. 
So I did a little bit um, of observation on the internet. And unfortunately, most of the search results, if you go from the first page until the third page, for example, all of them are um, articles that condemn the community. And most of the time we have to resort to using English to find something that could help us understand who we are. So um, here we can see how populating the internet with content from um, local languages, from um, regional languages that are still not represented on the internet. It's not only a matter of technology, but it's also political, it's also social. It relates to the um, social condition in the country, to how the government regulates the internet, to how the even when it comes to the technology, the um, how the technology facilitates people to um, create content, to share content, to increase the visibility of content, it, it we can see that it is important to facilitate to help those people who come from the minority groups, those people who are not speaking the colonial languages, for example, to be able to increase the visibility of their. Uh, content to be able to amplify their voices so that when other people are trying to look for a content that can help them in their own languages, they will be able to find it is they won't have to um, go through 10 pages on some search engines just to find like one positive content. So um, it relates to my wish. Um, one My one wish uh, for a multilingual internet is to have um, it's, it relates to what Emma said before. I wish um, there would be some technology that would make it easier for people to um, understand content in different languages so that um, when it comes to creating content on the internet, it, it doesn't only rely on people who um, populate the content on the internet, who, who create content on the internet, internet but these people can also understand easily content created by other people from the other side of the world i think that's very important because if you want to populate the content with local languages or native languages for example it will take a while but if we have the technology that would make this trans translation becomes more seamless that would help the minority groups to really understand to really get the content that they needed to help them to go through life in their environment I think that's it, Anastasia, thank you. Thank you so much, Pasca. And I'm still struck by the fact that, and I, and I want to sort of hold the fact that even as we talk about translation and translation technology, at the core of that, as we know, it's not going to be automatic if the content itself that we use, the data sets itself that we use are biased, are homophobic, are, 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 anti-queer, are non-progressive, are anti-feminist. They are not going to be the content and the language of all of us, of the world we want, of a world of justice and liberation, if we are not able to produce content in our own languages freely and safely. Um, so thank you again um, so much, um, Kasi. I'm going to move now to Sneha. And Sneha, I'm going to, you work with the Center for Internet and Society Bangalore, and you've really anchored the, the call for contributions, um, these deep stories, deep embodied experiences from around the world. Um, and your interests, of course, include digital media and cultures and, and access to knowledge. Is there one other embodied experience of the many that we have uh, in this languages report that you would like to highlight to add to what Amna and Pasca have just shared with us? Right, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Anasaya. So yeah, absolutely. I think um, as our collaborators have pointed out, um, you know, before this, of course, uh, I think multimodality for me is, is a thematic that has really stood out across um, all the stories uh, in this uh, report. I think all the stories present very embodied, very experiential narratives of uh, language. So whether through speech, signs, um, emojis, text, right? So, um, so if you look at some of the stories, uh, you know, the use of say, 
emojis, the use of um, say orality, um, you know, images, signs, etc., and how they question also this, you know, this whole sort of primacy of, um, you know, the textual and uh, the availability of textual content on the internet, right? So I think all the initiatives um, also use uh, the affordances of digital tools and platforms, uh, social media, etc., to illustrate this. Um, very beautifully. So just as, as examples, I think if you look at the Indijimoji project um, from Central Australia, I think, you know, which brings, I think, uh, indigenous words in the form of emojis um, online. So and through and accessed through an app now. I think that's a beautiful example. I think the project that is located on uh, in Turtle Island, I think, which uses Twitter to look at, again, translations of indigenous uh, uh, words, uh, right? So I think that's again, I think a beautiful example of this. So I think all through, um, you know, because I wouldn't be able to go through all of uh, the stories, but I think all of them in many ways uh, definitely kind of highlight uh, multimodality and really sort of um, tell us uh, what what kind of very sort of uh, multifaceted experiences uh, you know one can look at when we're looking at uh, languages. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sneha. Uh, thank you for that, for a little more flavor. And again, an invitation to everyone to look at these deep and wonderful stories in multiple languages. But we're now going to go to um, Martin because Martin really um, grounded uh, these deep uh, embodied experiences in a different way by number crunching and looking at uh, data across different platforms. Martin is a digital geographer and data scientist who's currently at the London borough of Lewisham, but he was at the Oxford Internet Institute when he worked with us to uh, hold this research together. So Martin, I'm going to ask you to walk us through the numbers uh, and, and show us how these, um, these deep experiences of all of us uh, are demonstrated through the data as well. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Um, so we, as, as uh, you were saying in the beginning, we were trying to approach this, this uh, question of uh, uh, languages online uh, through um, a number of uh, approaches uh, and the storytelling part, I think is incredibly important to give us a, a sense of the, the human impact um, that uh, uh, these shortcomings come up. At the same time, we were also trying to understand, can we estimate the scale at which this uh, takes place? Um, could we go to the next uh, slide, please? Um, so just as a brief recap, the, the, our starting point was, we, we know that there are about 7,000 languages that are spoken today. Um, we are starting to get a clear sense that this uh, online spaces don't reflect this, uh, this diversity. So we, one of the things that we were trying to understand is how many people are potentially affected by this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we were also, uh, we started by seeing what kind of research has been done. And, and there's of course a, a lot uh, that people have, uh, a lot of work that people have done to try and understand what kind of content is uh, available online and in which language is, is written. Um, in our discussions, we were, starting to think that maybe one of the specific questions we wanted to look at is uh, the question to what extent uh, language support or the absence of language support can be a potential barrier to entry. Amna had, had a, a few examples of that uh, in, her, in her story around th the terms of service uh, that might not, uh, uh, there might be police in a particular language, but not, not in others. But they're also even on a more basic level, the question when you open the app or when you go to a website, can you, can you understand uh, uh, what is being presented to you? Uh, um, so you can, you can even simply just uh, create an account. And can you do that part in your language? Can the website explain to you its workings in its own in, in your in the language that you would like to uh, that you would like to use? So we uh, identified a number of categories of websites of, uh, and of apps that we specifically wanted to look at. Uh, and we were particularly interested in uh, 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 platforms relating to knowledge access, like search engines, like Wikipedia and others, but also language learning and communication, so chat apps and so on. And we specifically, for each of these, we asked the question, um, is the interface of this website or of this app available in multiple languages? And if so, which ones are they? 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's the, the, it, to, to the brief summary of this, there's a lot of detail and we'll show some of that in, in a bit, but the brief summary is, uh, has been uh, highlighted multiple times already. It's, it's very clearly, um, it's, it's a very clear picture. Um, there's a small number of languages that are very widely supported and it tends to be, as Anasuya highlighted in the beginning, European colonial languages, um, certain, certain uh, majority languages in particular regions. Um, and thousands of languages are not supported at all. And then uh, 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 there are languages in the middle that are supported in certain circumstances, and we'll, we'll see examples of that. Um, one thing from an open knowledge perspective, one thing that we found very gratifying is to see that Wikipedia is really one of the platforms that's at, at the forefront of this. Wikipedia today supports about 300 uh, languages and it keeps growing, where there's both interface support as well as a growing amount of content. And Google search, Facebook are uh, kind of similarly, they're not not uh, quite as uh, uh, far, but they're 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 really good as well comparatively. So, uh, among messaging apps, Signal Messenger is really doing well, potentially as a result of its open source approach, because it can benefit from community contributions. Uh, Signal supports on the order of fifty to seventy languages, depending languages depending on the platform we look at. Those are the exception. Most platforms we looked at maybe support a dozen languages. Um, um, but I suspect the, uh, even those, that is only true for platforms that are relatively widely, um, widely used. Thank you, next slide, please. Um, one of the things we were, as I was saying, we were trying to understand is how many people are potentially affected by this. Um, we um, were, uh, um, uh, there, there's a language survey by, by Ethnolog, which is a data set um, uh, that tries to estimate for the, the, the languages spoken today, how many people speak that uh, language. And based on that, we can derive a kind of estimate. If, certain lang if a platform does not support certain languages, how many people are potentially affected by this? And through that, um, that kind of basic approach, we try to estimate for each of the platforms we looked at, how many people potentially cannot access this platform, this website, or this app, if they don't speak a second language. Um, and we can see here on the chart, it's broken out by, by particular platforms. We, we have websites at the top, Google Maps, Google Search, and so on. And then Android's apps in the middle, iOS apps on the bottom. Uh, I think particularly the, the blue ones uh, might be worth highlighting. These are the messaging platforms. Uh, and we can see, for example, uh, uh, Zoom, Telegram are potentially excluding a large number of people. We've, we've drawn this vertical blue bar here the, that dashed line, which uh, is, is kind of the, the um, uh, represents the threshold where half the world's population is potentially excluded. And, and both Zoom and, and Telegram are basically at, at or beyond that threshold. So they're really widely used platforms, but they're really not that great in their, in their language support. Um, so overall, we, we can assume most platforms we look at, billions of people are potentially excluded on the basis of language. Thank you, next slide please. Uh, we, we were then also trying to understand um, how does this relate to uh, the particular, uh, what are the effects on particular global regions with respect to the languages spoken in these regions? Um, because uh, as, as we, I'm sure all of you know, um, um, uh, um, uh, different languages are spoken. Well, while English might be a very widely spoken language, it's uh, uh, only a small number of people's first language. Uh, um, and it, it tends to be uh, language spoken in particular regions in, in, in uh, 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 European countries and in North America and so on. Uh, but most people uh, in the world who speak English learn it as a second language. And the, the same is true for, for many other languages. So language have a kind of ge geography they're spoken in particular places. So we, when we now look at uh, languages that are spoken in South Asia, which is India, Pakistan and, and uh, surrounding uh, countries, um, we see that most languages that are spoken there are not supported at all by most of the platforms we looked at. And you can see this on this chart here, um, which again, you see on the, on the left uh, vertically, you see the, the platforms we looked at. And at the bottom, uh, ordered by the number of speakers are South Asian languages, um, Hindi, Bengali, Urdu, and, and so on. Um, and we draw, we draw a a green box in, in a case when this particular platform has interface support for this particular language. 
and we, we can see there's not a lot of green boxes on this platform. And in, in fact, certain languages are made maybe more well supported, uh, as I've highlighted here, uh, Bengali or, or Bangla. Uh, but even even that, like most so most language, uh, most platforms don't don't really support uh, uh, Bengali as a, as a as an interface language. So this is certainly a case where most people need to switch to English or to another language in order to access these platforms. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, with Af African languages, it's, it's basically the same or even even uh, even more grave. So here, uh, uh, the chart looks visually a bit more mixed. Uh, we have uh, this, this additional shade of the light green. This is really a result of, um, of the, the way in which we try to uh, approach this, um, this kind of language matching, because Ethnologue is a, is a data set that is about spoken language, whereas we are looking at interface languages, which are written languages. And, and in many cases, they, they are one and the same, but in, in, in just as many cases, they're not. Uh, so you kind of try and estimate, okay, does this kind of script relate to, uh, can, can a, a speaker of this particular language, how likely is it that they, they will be able to read this, this, this kind of script? Um, there's a Unicode matching process, basically, that we're using to, to try and establish this kind of link. And while this works relatively well in many cases, in the case of African languages, it, it, the results end up kind of misleading. And this is where this light green comes in. What this really tells us is that um, a speaker of Swahili, of Hausa, of Yoruba, or other African languages most likely will be able to speak one of the languages that are supported by these platforms. But when we then look at what platform it tends to be offered, it tends to be a European colonial language. So here we have actually a double issue. First of all, again, most of that chart is, is, is really white, meaning most African languages are really not supported by any of these platforms. Um, but also it's really hard for us to see that in the data because the process we use, the Unicode process, makes the assumption, oh, they all speak English or they all speak French or they're, they're respective uh, uh, European colonial language. So it's fine, uh, which of course it's not fine. Um, thank you, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, we, we also uh, uh, looked at two platforms in particular where we're also trying to do a content analysis. There's, there's a, a lot of work we did on Wikipedia and there's an article about that you can access. For, for the purpose of this, uh, uh, this talk, we, we just thought we'd show it a few examples of Google Maps, uh, which is a bit more of a, of a, of a, of a novel uh, kind of research um, that people haven't necessarily asked many language questions about Google Maps before. So basically, we try to, given that Google Maps is, is widely used for people as a way to navigate their surroundings and to learn about the world around them, uh, we again ask this question, can, can you do that in your own language? And we, we picked a number of cities around the world, did a, 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 millions of search queries on Google Maps uh, uh, from different locations around the city in an automated way using translated uh, search terms. Uh, and then based on that, try to estimate how much information can Google offer you in, in different languages. And we see here three maps. Uh, one, one is for Kolkata in, in India, uh, showing the search results, the density of search results in Bengali, in Hindi, and in English. You see there's significantly more content in English offered than, than in Bengali and Hindi. All three languages are spoken in Kolkata. Um, and uh, again, English is in, in, in this city is the, is the European local Indian language. It's not historically a local language. And then at the, at the bottom, even more strikingly, these, these are two places in Africa, is Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Nairobi in Kenya, where we compare Google Maps content of, of in Swahili to content in English. And again, there is some content in English, uh, but really not a lot, if anything at all, in Swahili. Thank you. Next slide, please. So that this, we're just scratch, scratching the surface there. There's, there's, if, you, if you introduce these kind of data approaches, there's, there's, again, just like there's many more stories you can go into, there's also many more data points you can look at in, in our report. Uh, one of the key things that came out of it for me and one of the realizations I have, and also one of the wish, wishes I have is I think if we want to do better, we really need to reset our expectations. It's not enough for a platform provider to say, you'll add one or two more languages. Really the question should be, how can we add hundreds of additional languages to our, uh, to our platform support? Um, and uh, uh, we, yeah, we very much look forward to uh, creating uh, 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 to new approaches to, to asking, uh, asking this question. Thank you.
I think that's it for me. And I saw you are muted. Oops. Oh, tech. Um, thanks very much, Martin. And just reminding everyone, especially all of us, all of you who are data nerds, that uh, the data is uh, um, freely available. Martin's put the data up uh, in a GitLab repository that's linked from the uh, website, from his essays. So please uh, go look and explore more. Um, I'm now going to turn to, to my compañera and amiga, Claudia, who is a Latin American feminist and techie who handcrafted the code for uh, the website that is the State of the Internet's Languages Report. Um, I think she would have liked to have uh, walked us through it, but Claudia Amiga, I'm wondering in the interest of time, whether you'll talk us through it and people can on their own computers do a little searching and exploring while you talk us through some of the really um, extraordinary lessons that we've learned from the design and architecture of a truly multilingual and multimodal um, report. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you, Ana Suya. Hola a todas, todes y todas. Eh, gracias por acompañarnos el día de hoy para empezar. Um, and that will be in English. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, yes, Ana Suya, I think that would work. I have been pasting links on the chat anyway, so I hope people uh, are already browsing the website. Um, and um, yes, so to start with, uh, as you were saying before, uh, the internet, the state of the internet languages website was designed and created from scratch for this report, um, taking into account its uh, specific needs uh, regarding content architecture, uh, navigability, visual identity, accessibility, multilinguality, and so on. Um, one of the key pieces, key pieces of this uh, work has been translations and how to build a multilingual website. Um, the report website uh, at this moment is available in Bahasa Indonesia, Bangla, Zapotec, English, Spanish, Swahili, and Portuguese, uh, with Arabic, French, and Taiwanese Mandarin coming very soon. Um, to make this happen, uh, we work closely with different native speakers, translators, and viewers. Um, this was a uh, long and very demanding process. Um, so I think my first lesson to share is that human-centered translation uh, by contrast to machine-centered translation is a process that needs a lot of care and time. But it is also fulfilling and um, what is more important, uh, it contributes to bring people together and create a community around the project. Uh, which was uh, beautiful for this particular case. And then still building a multilingual website, but uh, from a more technical perspective, I wanted to share um, as another lesson the importance of choosing a framework and a language that has native Unicode support. In our case, I built the website with Hugo, which is an open source static website framework written in Go. And as a more personal choice, I used Tailwind CSS for building the interface. I made this static website to make it more secure, um, efficient, and also light. Uh, thinking about folks with limited uh, internet bandwidth who will mostly um, be browsing the site from the global south. And even though it has illustrations and it has an animation in the landing page, as you may already have seen, its performance score is very high. Mm, then one last lesson that I will share has to do with accessibility. Uh, we tried to make this report multilingual and multimodal in order to make it more accessible to everyone. Um, but also as a way to reflect the richness of languages themselves, since um, signed and oral languages are many times ignored when we talk about languages on the internet, because too often we tend to think about the internet, the internet as um, written first. 
Uh, so we made we have made available audio files in different languages of the summer report and of many of the stories. Um, and we are in in process of getting international sign translation of the summer report. So I would say that pushing the boundaries and going the extra mile for making any content online more accessible is definitely worth doing. And um, yeah, just to finalize, um, as we constantly remind us um, ourselves and our communities, this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, we will continue bringing new translations and improving and updating the website. So yeah, please stay tuned and visit the site and stay in touch with us. Gracias, amiga. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's been extraordinary work and Claudia has been the backbone of this extraordinary work. So really, thank you for holding it as you have. I'm going to turn to Dumi Sani um, now. And Dumi is an uh, engineer, a Wikimedian from South Africa who almost single-handedly brought the Sitsonga Wikipedia to life. And he's an old friend and co-conspirator. And when he saw this report, he had some very moving and important things to say. So Dumi, I'm going to turn to you and ask two things. One is, how would you like to see this report used? And what's your one wish for a multilingual internet? Thank you, Anasuya. Um, I definitely would like to see this report being used, especially by platforms that are uh, mentioned on the report, including Wikipedia, to understand that simply having a language instance on your platform doesn't make it, um, doesn't mean that you're suddenly accessible and that that's it, that's all you need to do. There's more work that needs to be done in all these platforms to bring these languages online because you know what, the internet is now the new frontier for languages. Our languages need to exist and if they are Oh dear, Dumi, have we lost you? I think we may have lost Dumi. Well, here is another issue and challenge for all of us who come from um, countries and regions in which internet not, infrastructure not on the is not as easy. There you are, Dumi, you're back. We're sorry, we totally lost you for a minute. I'm handing over back to you. Oh, you're, you're still off, uh, Dumi. I'm going to ask you when you come back, perhaps to add it into the chat. I'm sorry we're missing Dumi's very important voice and expertise, but uh, hopefully he will be able to come back and join in the the questions period. We have very little time left, but I would like to take maybe one question uh, for any one of our panelists and then um, do a closing together. Are there any questions um, for anyone? Would you raise your hand uh, using the, let me see, I, I need to go on gallery view so I can see you all. Um, would you raise your hand using the Zoom hand that we have all learned to use over the last two and a half years more than we ever thought we would? Uh, Thomas, go ahead. Hi all, thank you for the great session. I uh, really enjoyed the work also from last year, the report, this is such a great follow-up. Just how can are we all get involved or follow your work um, going forward, I guess, um, in many different places around the world? It's just great to follow, but yeah, what can we do to follow and, you know, uh, so just... Thanks for that, Thomas. I'm going to come back to that because we have... Uh, uh, ideas for that, uh, of course. I'm just going to take uh, the question from Steve. I think, Steve, you had your hand up. Um, Steve? Or are you? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, I, I had a just a basic question about um, how much um, how much the fact that um, 
I mean, all programming languages, but especially like HTML and CSS are, are obviously English-based languages. Um, how much does that affect this um, as far as, you know, being able to create your own things online um, without relying on some sort of framework? Especially, sorry, especially considering um, the concept of semantics in, in HTML, which, um, you know, relies on a very, uh, a very clear understanding of what these words mean, which are in the, the elements, the HTML elements. It's an excellent question. And I know at least a few of us on this panel had thoughts about it. Um, Pasca, you're nodding. Would you like to take that? Sure. Go ahead. So yeah, um, previously I interviewed some people who tried to bring up knowledge and information and to create like some platforms some websites that contains articles related to the queer community in Indonesia. And one of the challenges that they told me is that it's very difficult to just build a website from, from scratch. So oftentimes they have to use this um, ready to build um, platforms to create the website. And even when it comes to this website, they also have difficulties to understand like the tutorials, the procedures to uh, modify, to customize the website because it's in English, it's not in Indonesian. So they have these challenges. And because of this, um, it's very difficult to find like um, content in the form of a website or web pages. So most of the content for when it comes to queer Indonesians exists on social media instead. So that that is um, one of the challenges. And I think it would be great if we can somehow adopt or create or provide like translation when it comes to the technical sites of building or modifying a website so that people from different uh, who use different languages can um, create websites and can um, do more when it comes to uh, providing contents through web pages. I, I'm Thank you for that, Pascal. And I'm just going to quickly add, Steve, I think there are significant epistemic issues around the fact that most of our programming languages are English based. Uh, as Pasca pointed out, and as you are thinking about. And in fact, I think one of the, the exceptions that, are, that proves this is uh, the Arabic language created by Ramsi Nasir uh, Kalb, which literally shows you how, when you are programming in a different language, the epistemics and the design and architecture shift because of the way the language itself conceptually shifts um, yeah. our coding. And so I think it's a really important part of our work as techies to think about this uh, more deeply. Yeah, thanks Thanks for your answer, that, that was good. Um, just, I just, just wanted to quickly add to that, yeah, what you just said um, was really evident to me. I, I worked, I was lucky enough to work in, in Japan for a little while and I worked alongside Japanese front-end engineers. And I just, it was just strange for me to witness them um, writing code in you know English words and they would tell me they had no idea what these words meant they just it, would, it was just symbolic to them right so so um, they were really missing a lot of the context um, and it's just something that stuck with me so yeah thank, thanks guys appreciate your answers thank you and I'm I'm just I'm uh, conscious of time knowing that this is a conversation that continues to need to happen and we want to be in conversation with you. Um, so to uh, Thomas's question, please find us at whose knowledge, whose knowledge org, or the state of, uh, of the Internet's Languages Report, which is internetslanguages.org. Um, languages at whose knowledge org will reach us. Uh, all of our various social media handles will reach us at any time. And um, we would just love to be in conversation. The report itself has a call to action, a little bit of a manifesto at the end, and it is segmented into all of our different profiles. Some of us are multiple, uh, we wear multiple hats, but we would love to see you uh, in conversation with us. Let's take this forward. And therefore, in order to, to, to close this in a way that I think has meaning, if anyone would like to share their one wish for a multilingual internet in their language, I invite you to do so now. And if you can't speak it, can you put it into the chat? But I will take at least one or two um, in your language, um, translated into English if you can, because I think it is important that we embody 
that our wish list is also in our languages. Uh, is there anyone who would like to express their one wish for a multilingual internet in their languages? Well, if uh, we don't have anyone at this moment, this may be the moment I invite Dumi Sani again. If Dumi, you can, at least by voice, share with us in one of your nine languages, Dumi speaks nine languages, in one of your nine languages, would you tell us your wish list? Your wish, sorry. Your list is long, your one wish. <laughs> You're muted, Dumi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh no, we could hear you and now we can't hear you. Ah, well, that feels like the state of the internet's languages for all of us who are not English speakers. We can hear you and now we can't hear you. I'm so sorry, Dumi. I'm sorry we're not bringing you in by voice, but um, to everyone else, just um, thank you. Please keep the conversation going with us. Thomas, thank you for your one wish uh, that uh, other internet organizations copied the kind of approach that Mozilla has taken with its localization uh, communities to build communities around languages. And this is one of the reasons why we're talking to you at Mozilla, because um, this is a community that understands some of these deep issues. And we hope that perhaps the next uh, Moss Fest will actually have simultaneous interpretation so that we can all speak in our languages of choice to each other because we are different humans in our languages of choice. So thank you all. Terima kasi, shukran, tonnobad, tanyavad galu, danke, gracias. Thank you all for joining us today. And please let's continue the conversation to build the multilingual multimodal internets of our, of our hopes and dreams and joys. Thank you everyone.